is it's a Hebrew word called which means your job is to make it better. Here we go. Here we go. We have I think we have him here. He is coming. Let's add him. Damien Chazelle, I think he may be coming. You know, it takes a little while with technology, but we are very grateful. Let's see if this is gonna work. We're waiting. See, we're waiting for it to click. It's connecting. Damien! Hey! How are you? I'm good. I'm okay. How are you doing? Are you in the middle of uh, your callbacks, I heard? Is that right? Yes. Yeah. You're making, your, you're making your, your Babylon, is that true? Is that correct? Yeah, well, you know, we're... we're uh... Uh, I have no, no idea when we'll be shooting it, but yes, uh, no uh, trying to, do, trying to do as much as we can in the meantime, yeah. Here's something I want to tell everybody. First of all, I am so honored and thankful. You know, uh, Damien was the first person I wrote. I said, let's try to do something for the artists out there. And he was the first person who said, absolutely. But for, for people who don't know, you know it, it means a lot to me. You're a very special human being. Uh, for people who don't know, is the most beloved director in town. It is absolutely true. He's someone who puts his heart and soul, yes, you are, into your, into your, everything you do. You are a true dreamer. You have said that if you don't try, you don't really live. You are the youngest recipient of the Academy Awards for Best Director. You've been nominated for three Academy Awards. You, you are a true dreamer. You make you turn your dreams into reality. And so I thank you for coming on, Mr. Damien Chazelle. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, no. I, want, I want to ask you, I want to ask you a question. I want to, first yeah. of all, I'd let you know that we have artists from all over the world here. Yep. And uh, I just wanted to celebrate artists and dreamers, really. And I think that you are the ultimate dreamer. I mean, all your characters and all your films from Whiplash and uh, First Man and La La Land, they're all dreamers. And they're all trying to do something attainable. I want to ask you, what has uh, following your dream taught you? <laughs> well, I guess the, 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 the big thing I think that I learned or have learned or continue to learn or have to keep relearning is, is that it's, is that it's a process and and you kind of i think uh, many sort of movies for one teach us maybe that you know it's like you have an idea and you attain it or you have a dream and it comes true or it doesn't come true but it's everything is kind of instantaneous and this idea that like you know that um that things happen quickly or that you roll out of bed and you're already what you want to be and if you aren't that then you never will be i think the whole thing i kind of and i think i learned it more from playing music when i was younger than than, than i actually did from from movies but i've just tried to apply it to movies is that is that it's it's this never-ending process of just trying to get better at whatever it is you do trying to push yourself trying to not stay in your comfort zone trying to you know push that boulder up the hill even if it keeps rolling back down i think I mean, I think the closest I probably came to trying to really deal with that in 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 story form, what was in Whiplash, which on the one hand is is, is sort of dark, a dark way of looking at it. Um, but um, and I did want to look at both, I guess, the light and the dark of it. But um, but I think just that fundamental idea that you know that no one is, I think, no one is born, you know, kind of, uh, or maybe few people are born a great drummer or a great carpenter or a great you know uh, 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 basketball player or a great anything like whatever it is that, there, that, that that you kind of set your sights on set your passion on I think it can, it can apply to almost anything uh, it takes time it takes practice it takes um, and that practice also I think of like what defines practice is what is actually not comfortable in the moment, not fun to do. If you're only kind of doing what's fun and what sort of seems to come to you easily, you're not really pushing yourself. So I do believe that there's that working at it bit by bit, sometimes for longer than you think even makes sense. Um, and just being persistent that um, I think I think certainly I had to learn the hard way. I think moving to LA, kind of thinking like, oh, well, I've always wanted to make movies. I'm going to move to LA and I'm going to make movies. And it's not uh it's not how it happened so i kind of had to find ways to use the time that i had to just keep writing or keep you know 
uh, uh, keep trying to get better and knock on doors and get better at my own craft and, you know, just trying to trying to keep pushing the boulder up the hill, so to speak, but just knowing that we it's have, taking a long time. We have a lot of dreamers uh, like you around the world. We especially want to reach out to all the ones in Italy and all the ones um, in Spain and all the other places, all the artists around the world. What do you think, how, in, what piece of advice would you give to a dreamer out there? What kind of advice would you give them? What, you know, because you came also from a very difficult way. I mean, nothing came easy for you. I mean, you just have this, this idea uh, and this, like, will to make it happen. But what piece of advice would you give who are now thinking maybe something's unattainable? What, what was the secret ingredient that you had? Well, I mean, so on the one hand, I think that, uh, I mean, I guess I would, disclaim anything I, I have to say with, you know, that, that obviously in many ways I was, I was, you know, I was very lucky in the sense that, and very privileged in the sense that, you know, my, my, my parents were, were, you know, were okay with the idea of me trying to go into the arts, even if it wasn't their, uh, you know, maybe initially their first choice, you know, they were, they were supportive. I had the benefit of, you know, I only got into music really because at, at the, uh, the high school I was going to, they happened to have a great music program. That was just sort of luck and circumstance, you know, so it's just so much of it I, I'm, I'm definitely aware and one has to be aware comes from the sort of uh, what's around you and you, you draw from what's around you. Um, and uh, uh, so, so I guess, so I guess I have to kind of, you know, anything I did or, or sort of that I tried to do on my own was definitely, uh, you know, benefited from those circumstances and that, uh, and that uh, setting in which I found myself. I think that, you know, in terms of advice that could sort of apply, apply anywhere, I mean, especially, I think the one thing that's really kind of great, that also makes it difficult, but great and magical about movies or and i think this applies to acting to writing to directing um uh but but uh and it can apply to other art forms as well but any narrative art form really uh, or any kind of emotional art form where you're trying to talk about the human condition you're trying to sort of express human emotions is is that ultimately your life is your material and and so uh you know it's it, it, it's it's there's a way to actually turn almost anything into fodder for yourself, you know, and um, and I think, you know, uh, I remember I remember reading once about um, there was like an interview Paul Thomas Anderson did back in uh, you know back a few years ago, and he was talking about how you know well, he was growing up in the valley in L.A. and it sort of seems like the epitome of, of, of kind of mundane boringness to him. That you sort of look around and all his heroes would be like, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, people like Sam Peckinpah, you know, by, by that age had been out, you know, kind of uh, uh, taming bulls and fighting, you know, uh, fighting wars. And, uh, and you know, uh, Melville had been, you know, uh, uh, had been basically uh, out to sea in a whaler himself before he wrote Moby Dick and all this stuff. It seems like all these people had had these kind of adventurous sort of lives. And here he was, just a kid in the valley. Uh, uh, in LA, just kind of looking around at strip malls and sort of asking himself, well, what, I've never been to war, I've never been here, like, what, what do I know? Well, I know what these strip malls look like. I know what the, you know, that, that bedroom of, you know, being in a bedroom with a girlfriend and trying to figure out what you want to do with your life looks like. I know what this looks like. And so he actually just, you know, realized he could, I know what these kind of fringes of show business look like because, because, because uh, he was growing up in that sort of milieu. So he was able to kind of use those things and turn them into things like Boogie Nights or into some of his early films where, where they feel in their way just as vivid as something that's set during war or set during, uh, uh, set on a whaling ship. Uh, in other words, you can make anything feel epic. And so, you know, in my case, what felt epic to me, what felt like being at war to me was, ironically, now I almost laugh about it, thinking, thinking, uh, thinking of it was being in music class when I was like a teenager and being, uh, you know, having a teacher I was scared to death of. And, uh, and were there any real stakes? You know, in Hollywood, they're always talking about, like, well, what are the stakes? As though, like, any only stories worth telling are ones where it's like the whole fate of the world hangs right. in the back. But that's not, that's, that's often not the case. And, and the stakes often can just be what you make of them, you know? So it's like trying to take the things in, in your own life, trying to be personal, 
trying to, that's often what I sort of recommend people when they're starting out especially, is try to identify what it is in your own life that you can relate to in a way that other people can't, that you can sort of relate to because you've lived it. And it doesn't mean you only do autobiographies or you only serve as an actor play yourself or anything like that. It just means that you try to isolate those moments or those things, no matter how mundane or small they might seem. It might be nothing more than like a time that a, a person stood you up uh, or, or a time that, you know, that you missed the bus or a time that you got a bad grade or a time that, you know, uh, uh, a parent slapped you like, for, 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 uh, for misbehaving. It could be really small things, but if they made an emotional impact, try to kind of identify that and use that as the fodder for your art, basically, for the story you're trying to tell or the performance you're trying to give. I think that's, that, that to me, I think, can be universal and, um, and I think is always at least the first way to go, I think, that I'd recommend. Well, you know what you do, all your characters, it's really about the common thing, the common man. I mean, if you see a movie like It's a Wonderful Life, it's about a common man. He's not doing anything extraordinary, but he recognizes that it's about love, it's about friendship. And I think that's sort of what's important in your films, is that you're recognizing that we are, because we are having to stay home, what are, what are we missing? We're missing a smile, we're missing love. Every, in fact, when, when someone's no longer here, you always miss the most small things. You don't miss the big yes. things. And what, and what you're talking about is you make a movie about just holding someone's hand and everybody will understand it because we're all exactly alike. This is the first time in the world history where all of us are going through the same thing. Hug my children. And that's what everybody yeah. wants to do, just hug. It's about, the movie's yeah. about a hug. Everybody, you don't have to do World War II. It's about yeah. a hug. It's about yeah. living life. You know, well, that's, you have... That's, 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 I think, just like you hit the nail on the head of, of even our, our most of our experience of this global this global thing that you're right is like like few events in history is kind of uniting everyone around the globe. Our experience of it still tends to be very micro. It's about, you know, uh, uh, like the, the actual moment to moment experience and wanting to be with this person or hug this person. It's it's uh, that's kind of how humans experience the world. So I, I really do think you can find the big and the small. You can find the epic. In well, the, we're, we're, all, we're all the same. We all want to be loved. We all want to be understood. We all, right. it's all about the small. It's all yeah. about the things. Now, I want to talk about the two seconds because I don't. I know I have time. When you did Whiplash, when you decided to Whiplash, you first did an 18-minute short, right, to prove yeah. that you could do it. Is that correct? And uh, yeah. so, was, 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 I mean, you've, you, uh, let's even go back to your first movie. Your first movie, Guy and Madeline. Wasn't that your first movie that you did? Uh, sorry, I'm just plugging in here so I don't... <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, so the, well, Guy and Madeline, I was in school. That was kind of... Yeah. Uh, it's basically student film, yeah. Uh, but that was the first, yeah, first movie. Uh, but you just did it. Did. Is it true Sorry. that you improvised? The whole, is it true you improvised that film? Was it improvised? Yeah, well, mostly, yeah. I, I'd written, um, I'd written a script or kind of like a treatment, but the, but it was really just used as sort of like loose kind of points because m most of, like a lot of the people in that film hadn't acted before. The, uh, um, the lead guy was just a, a, a was a trumpeter and not an actor, and so it, it, we were kind of trying to mix documentary and fiction and sort of let people, in that case, sort of have people play versions of themselves. But it was very, I mean, part of the reason why I did the, the Whiplash short was that uh, even though Guy Malin was also about a jazz musician, style-wise, it couldn't be more different from, from Whiplash. So it was very hard, I think, when I wrote the script of Whiplash for people to you know, people in Hollywood, at least, to kind of wrap their minds around, well, absolutely. How, how, how would you direct this, and how, what would this look and feel like? <laughs> um, and so it was, it was actually the, you know, I was all gung-ho, thinking, again, like, naively thinking, like, well, yeah, I could just, you know, obviously, I've made a movie before, I can, I can make this. It was the producers, actually, who kind of uh, recommended to me, had the idea of, like, you know what, let's, let's, let's do this right, let's take a, in order to really get the, the the budget we need to make this, let's let's first just pull out a scene from the script and do it as a short film, and just do it as a kind of proof of concept, um, and uh, and then we'll use we'll use that as a way of selling you know selling you as a director basically. So that's you know that, that, you, have that's this, you have this personality which seems that you want something and you sort of just go after it. But I want to know what's the best piece of advice anyone ever gave you. What makes uh, you run? What's that? What's that? 
Damien thing you got going? Where is that coming from? That's that's so unusual. You just, you sometimes talk about that I will will to make something work. Where did this come from? What's the best piece of advice you ever been given? By the way, so well, I'm saying that you look you look a little blurry. Are you a little blurry, or it's or is it the picture? Do you look a little blurry? Picture blurry or knee blurry? No, 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 no. no. I think it's like the picture is blurry. So uh, maybe can you find some of the? They're just uh, no, yeah, they're like they, yeah, because you're yeah. such. A, yeah, there it is. You're a little bit blurry, so... Maybe it's blown out. There it is. Now it's better. better. There you go. Okay. Now you go. Okay. Oh, I knew what it was. I think it was the, the yeah, the sun behind me. It was blown yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, so what you've ever been given? What is something like that? Well, <laughs> you know, I remember, uh, this goes back to what I was saying before, like this idea of a process. I remember when I was, uh, when I was, uh, uh, a musician, a drummer, and I was in this, uh, this, uh, basically this, this band, this jazz, this ensemble in, in high school, in my case, and, um, this teacher that I was really afraid of, who kind of wound up sort of inspiring whiplash, um, uh, initially I was in this kind of like more, you know, for, for, uh, there was basically an intermediate, like a beginning level, an intermediate level, and the advanced level. And the advanced level was run by this really scary teacher. So initially, I was in the like intermediate, and right. I, and I was really enjoying it. It was actually really fun to just kind of you know it was it was the, the fun of playing music and all this stuff. And then the this terrifying teacher comes in and he plops me into he sees me play and he plops me into the uh, the advanced uh, group. And I literally, I I actually after a day of sitting in the sitting in the advanced group and seeing those people play their instruments, I thought I was so he made such a mistake. And I was going to be so humiliated being in this thing that he obviously hadn't thought this through or had just seen something that wasn't there. So I literally went to his office after hours and and told him, um, you know, I'm, I'm flattered that you put me in this band, but honestly, I think it's a mistake. I don't think I'm good enough uh, to be in this. And he, he looked at me and, and, and completely bluntly just said, Giselle, you would only call me by my last name. I remember that. Giselle. I didn't put you in the band because you're good enough. I put you in the band because you will be good enough. Now go practice your head off. And that was it. And he sent me out of the office. And and so basically what I did was I practiced my head off. And and he was right. I was not good enough. And every time he put me on to play, I did embarrass myself for basically the next two years, even three years. It wasn't until the very end of my tenure there that I, would, I could say I actually could hold my own there. But... But I became a better drummer as a result than I ever would have uh, uh, otherwise. So that idea of like of doing something not because you are good enough, but because you can be, because you because will you be. could be good enough, because you can be. Exactly that, that that idea of not just accepting, you know, it's sort of your your for getting better, getting better. Exactly. That seems exactly. to be you. You always try to get better. Yeah. I think you always can get better. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things that I, that I want to ask about is uh, we have a lot of actors who are listening to you. What three pieces of advice would you give for actors who are starting? What would you think is important? You've worked with some of the great actors. What, would you, what, what are you looking for when you, when you cast? What are some of the things you, you're looking for when you see, meet somebody? And what piece of advice could you give them? Well, I do think... Uh, you know, it's, it's tough because it because it, it winds up depending so much on each actor. Right. One thing, one, one thing I really like, I had to learn myself as well, was that there's no sort of right method. You know, I'd work with one actor who would just have uh, uh, totally dialed in how they liked to do things, and then another right. actor would have the exact opposite uh, right. method, and they would each give great uh, results. To me, it's it, you know. It, 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 it boils down to probably, you know, yeah, just a couple, like, fundamentals, one of which is, I think, you know, always remembering, especially, you know, if you're sort of segueing between theater and film, that film is ultimately this sort of closer, more intimate medium than theater, so it doesn't mean you can't be bombastic and over the top in film. That could truthful, be really fun. truthful seems to be what you're looking for. Always real. Oh, we have we have you frozen somewhere. There he is. He's frozen. He's frozen and telling us that. Okay. Okay. Uh, just uh, back. Yeah, yeah. So basically, just just to I think just to be aware that sometimes in film, like literally 
thinking you're doing nothing in a take can be doing everything. Like I really do believe, and it, it, it's like it's, and, and you can see it by looking sometimes at silent cinema. It's just like if you strip away the dialogue and you just look at reaction shots or listening shots, just moments that that normally you would think are where you're not doing enough. Those are the moments where a lot of the poetry of cinema uh, can come through. It's very different from the theater, where you often do have to fill the space and fill this giant theater you're projecting to. In a close-up or even in a medium shot in film, um, uh, less is more. Not always, but but often. It's often something I find that people, especially when they're auditioning and they're nervous, that nervousness tends to exhibit itself in filling things and filling business. Well. Yeah. And and so that's often something I think people can just remind themselves is to do less, to do less is often often a good a good piece of advice. Um, but then I think you know the other thing that's maybe even more important is sort of going back to what I was saying about trying to draw from your own personal life. Like at the end of the day, if you know, it's like actors actors are their own instrument you know so it's like they're both the musician and the instrument all wrapped up in one so at the end of the day it just comes down to like do they feel unique do they feel interesting in some way it's like there's so many cases i find so fascinating especially in film where you know actors who where you could pinpoint and go you don't quite have the skill level or the technique or the school but there's something there and i just have to watch you um and and that's part of what's fascinating, I think, about film acting is that it, is that some of the greatest actors are, are ones who, who who studied and studied and studied, and some of the greatest actors are ones who did it completely differently. The thing that unites them is just that they're unique, that they're interesting, and ultimately, I think that just means that they're making choices that are personal. They're not just trying to kind of shape themselves into a cookie cutter idea of what Hollywood wants and like get exactly the same you know haircut and exactly the same this and like oh I, I you know this is how. Uh, you know, so and so big stars set their lines, so I'm going to say my line this way. It's that they allow themselves to be a little unique, a little idiosyncratic, a little uh, like we all are. We all are essentially inherently unique as humans. Uh, it's just that sometimes we have this knee jerk tendency to try to wipe away the uniqueness. Of right. The now, to try to be okay, absolutely. Yeah. One of the things that I talk about a lot is that wanting to, letting your authenticity show. Because Absolutely. if you're authentic, you're different. We're all different. We have yeah. 20 little kids together. We all know which one, which one the kids are. Or this is your kid. But if 20 yeah. adults, some of them are all acting the same. We're sort of <laughs> born unique, and we sort of die a copy. You know, I think that's what. Well, that's that's a great way to put it. Yeah. No, we learn to become less original, kind of. Yes. As we grow older. Uh, we are fortunate to have Al Pacino uh, come to us, and he said that you can capture my face uh, to, uh, you know, in a film. But until you capture my soul, you don't have a movie. And Jessica yeah. Chastain agrees with you because she says, which is what I talk about and teach, which is acting happens when you're not talking. Only speak if you can improve on the silence. Uh, that's a beautiful way of putting it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Don't <laughs> talk. That's a great lesson. Yeah. Because, because in most important moments in life, there's silence. Yeah. It's true. It's you here like, you know, by the way, I want to ask you, I'm sorry I didn't ask before, how is your beautiful wife and your baby? How is the, everything going in your house over there? Everything, everything's good here, you know. This has actually been, uh, uh, you know, obviously the, uh, as it is for so many people around the world, you know, the sort of isolation and quarantine, all of it's a, a change, but... Um, uh, I feel really fortunate that, you know, that we actually have each other and that, and that uh, you know, it's kind of this, uh, certainly spending a lot more time with, with the baby than I thought. Your baby's name is, Fer what's, for none? What's, what's your baby's name? Uh, Ferdinand. Ferdinand, yes, I heard yeah. something like that. So, so, uh, so I'm getting to, yeah, getting to know him pretty well. And uh, <laughs> uh, so actually, yeah, so there is, you know, trying to look on the positive side. Yeah, well, the yeah, positive side is instead of thinking of quarantine, think artist in residence. Which oh, that's is, great. How about that? Great. That's how about artist that? in residence, yeah. Uh, this, artist this, in res this, this is the, uh, exactly, this is the, um, the, uh, the chip that, that, that artists all over the world can have to play a little bit is that, you know, in some ways, no one is more equipped to just be isolated at home alone than artists. Um, so, uh, By the so, way, we have someone who just came on, Joanna Kulik, who, I, who, who just came on. I love Joanna. I know, we all love Joanna. Did she, you are, 
was she uh, in, and was she like uh, videoing in from from yeah. from, Europe, from Poland from or Poland something? yes from yeah. Poland she's from Poland she just came in so I saw her and so she's a big fan of yours now we're going to talk about your movies but what about the Eddie when is, is that playing now is it started the, the movie the Eddie uh, that, it's gonna, it, that, that drops on Netflix in a, a, a month it's like early May I think it's May oh because I'm May. thinking like I want to see it I hear now what I want to ask you you have a love of musicals like nobody else. I love musicals. My whole past has been, I performed in Broadway musicals. I think singing yeah. and dance is great. Where did you get the love for musicals? Well, I, I was kind of late to musicals, ironically. I, I, I was, not, you know, other than playing music, I loved movies and I loved playing music. But in terms of the two marrying together, musicals, I was not a big fan growing up. I always sort of found it annoying when, like, you know, the, the story would stop and people would start singing and dancing. Right, right. And, and um, uh, to me, it wasn't until, yeah, kind of like uh, high school into college, like when I was around 18, 19, that I really, I remember I started kind of, First, like rewatching things that I'd seen as a kid, but hadn't really appreciated, like singing in the rain, things like that. But then also, I think the real key, the thing that really unlocked it for me, was was discovering different kinds of musicals. Like when I discovered the films of Jacques Demy and movies like The Umbrellas of Cherbourg and The Young Girls. Can you talk about that movie? Because I want every person yeah. to see it. Because I remember that. Uh, but because I was looking you up, and I said I gotta take a look at that movie. It's what is it yeah. called again? The Umbrellas. The Umbrellas of Cherbourg. Sure, uh, which, is, which is a French town, right? It's in French. Yep, yep. It's a French movie, and uh, exactly, Cherbourg is a French town. It's the last yeah. place you expect there to be a musical, uh, and that's part of what's amazing about the, the, the movie. Unlike a lot of Hollywood musicals, it's, it's a, a, you know, a musical that's completely about ordinary people. It's set in an ordinary town, and, uh, and it doesn't, you know, I don't want to give too much away, but it doesn't have a sort of Hollywood ending. No, kind it of. doesn't. It's, it's, your films are not full of happy ending, but I feel from you, it's sort of like the purpose of life is not to win, but the purpose of life is trying to win. And if you don't win, it doesn't yeah. really matter. Just going after it, it seems to be in your films. But well, what, by the way, what, what I love about the ending of Umbrella Sherborg, and I guess what sort of inspired me was that, as you say, it's not a happy ending. It's also not really, at least I see it, it's not really a tragic, you know, sad ending. No. It's somewhere in between, which is uh, how so much of life is but that in betweenness is you know you see it a lot in european cinema it's something that i always felt you know i didn't see enough of in american cinema necessarily and so it's, by the it's, way that uh, movie michelle grant's music is the killer i mean that is one oh, of the best stories ever um, oh, yeah. so now, it was nominated and i'm not telling you i'm telling the people who are like, they nominated for five academy awards this is quite a film uh, we have so many films to talk about certainly you are romantic and in love with i'm in love with la la land i mean where you were making that film for a long time in your mind with your friend uh, that you met in college justin right yep. Yep. and uh and and it's it's one of the most beautiful films but it's it's like there's a scene which i want every actor to see i think it just grabs me which talks about uh the audition scene for mm. emma stone and the words are just uh, so powerful uh, here's to the ones who dream foolish as they may seem a bit of madness is key to give us new colors to see and when she sings that, it's like, you know, I think that a lot of artists and dreamers are kind of put down around the world, which is one of the reasons I go around the world, is to tell them that I think that it's so important that without dreamers, where would our life be? What advice do you have? What came, why did you, why did you want to make La La Land? Because it's beautiful and the colors are beautiful. It's just, where did you get all this? How come, yeah, here's what I'm asking. How come you're so talented? That's what it is. I don't know why you're so talented. That's why. Oh, stop. Uh, uh, well, La, La, La Land was certainly, I mean, uh, I, I don't think I ever would have had the, the impulse to, to make that without seeing things like The Umbrellas of Cherbourg and, and those, those U European musicals. Because it, 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 um, I think I was so fascinated by that idea of, like, of, of combining you know the colors and the beauty and the spectacle uh that you know we sort of associate with old hollywood the fantasy of it 
but with a more kind of realistic, grounded, ordinary life sort of look at the world where it's, it's, it's uh, you know, it's not about, um, kind of as we were talking about, it's not about like giant tumultuous events, it's about yeah. the small things, you know, and, 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 and uh, so I think that was the sort of basic impulse and, and, um, but I think the thing also, like when you were talking about the the audition scene and, and um, oh my god, the, 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 uh, uh, yeah, you know, what you were saying about like uh, like yeah, actors especially being put down so much. I what I always find so, I guess what I, one thing I've always admired in actors and I find kind of paradoxical about the that job is that on the one hand, part of the art is is being as sensitive and sort of emotionally naked as possible just kind yeah. of like it's certainly the actors i respond to the most are often the ones where you almost feel like you can see like what pacino was saying you can see into into them as though they're like this open wound where you just yeah. you see every fiber you see every nerve ending but on the other hand the job of an actor nine times out of ten is being rejected is going up for an audition and being told no or going up for this and being told no it's a thousand no's to every one so you have to be incredibly thick-skinned in order to in order to like survive for a minute so how, how can you reconcile the sort of artistic need to be as thin-skinned and sensitive and open-hearted as possible with the practical need to be as thick-skinned and tough and nothing's going to get to me as possible and it's it's sort of this paradox that um that i think uh, sometimes actors almost don't get enough credit for so um so I think I was thinking about that a lot, especially when, when, when Emma and I were working on her character in that song and everything in, oh in La La Land, that it's, that it's um, how emotionally draining that sort of process, especially in the beginning of an actor's career, can be, you know? And, um, now, you've yeah. also had some ups and downs in your career. Uh, I, I don't want to bring up something negative, but I was looking back and I remember La La Land won Best Picture for about a minute and a half. For about yes. 30 seconds. Yeah. For 30 seconds, you won Best Picture. You're <laughs> up there, the whole thing, everybody's talking. Can you tell us a little bit what was that like? I don't want to bring up something, but you're in history. No, no, no. no. I, I mean, you have. I love your film. I think it's one of the best. I always find. Well, what is the story? I'm not. I find. I, no, I know. I find it funny to reminisce because the the. Uh, I mean, that whole thing was so surreal because it's like being at the being at the Oscars already is sort of surreal and and um, and uh, and then so that whole thing was like this extra cap. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, it's like. Uh, like by the end of that road you've been to so many award shows we've gotten to know all the all the sort of folks from from the uh you know from the, from moonlight and 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 you know cast and, and and crew and and so it kind of wound up there i remember like when, what i remember most people was sort of being on the stage with all of us just because of this this sort of epic fuck up but there was something kind of beautiful about that uh, on my end i know like uh, maybe not everyone sees it the same way but um um so it, it felt sort of weirdly fitting in, in in that sense but it's also you know it's like you were saying like it, 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 at, the end, day, at the end of the day it's, it's, about your movie where you don't actually have the happy ending but a good ending look at that it's like your life you it doesn't have to be sad exactly yeah, it it's not a sad because, ending. i guess that's my point just because it's yeah. not the uh the, yeah. that, that you know the, the dichotomy of the, the win versus the lose it's like it doesn't have to be uh, it could still be it could still be a, a a rosy outcome in its own way. So I guess that's what I that's what I took from it. But um, but uh, like, <laughs> very dreamlike. Very yeah, it's dreamlike. No, but I think that in many ways it's it's historic. It's a different thing. It's kind of like La La Land. Uh, in the fact that it doesn't have anything away, the most perfect ending, everybody gets together, because life is not about that. But you talk a lot about that that your job is to go after your dreams, go after your love, even if you don't get it. But without that, you're not alive. I mean, there's there's certain lessons. I have to talk about your whiplash. When I first saw that movie, it reminded me of Raging Bull. I mean, the way you cut the edit, oh, so bang, 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 bang. Uh, you, were you influenced by those filmmakers? Is that what you uh, For sure, yeah. Yeah, no, my, especially yeah, my, my editor and I, Tom and I, we were looking at, looking at the boxing scenes in Raging Bull and looking at... Uh, car chases and the French connection and um, you know it, it, we've, we've realized I mean what was funny about making whiplash is that I was mainly looking at movies that weren't about music I was mainly looking at movies that were actually about physical exertion or violence really you know so 
car chases, boxing matches, war movies. We lost him, but he's still here. Oh yeah, yeah I'm still here. Oh, but now, now, now I see the time. I'm actually, I'm actually late for my. Oh dear, I got you're late. First of all, I want to thank oh, you for <laughs> giving us your time. Oh, thank uh, you. You would have been, so you would have been interviewed in my class. We love you. Keep sharing your gift. I want to thank you on behalf of everyone. We love. We need people like you to show us uh, what's possible because you teach you. us that anything is possible because you're a person like that. The dreams are not escape from reality, but dreams is showing what our life can be on screen. So thank you very much. I know you have to run. I thank you. I thank, thank you, you. And for sharing, for sharing your Instagram. And say hello to your family. And we'll talk soon. All the best. Thanks so much. And thanks for doing thank, this. No, thank you for doing this. And thank you. I appreciate it. Bye. See you All later. Right. Take care. <laughs> bye. Bye, bye. Oh, my God. It's, it's, he's so incredible. For what? It's just, you know what? You don't get a chance to... Uh, I hope you get a chance to uh, ever meet this guy. He is the kindest, the most humble person. What you saw is exactly him. He's always, he was very open when I met him during Whiplash time.